Fourth. Fourth meetup. Uh, first one at Bloomberg. Uh, we're going to be back here. Um, in May. In May, uh, which is great. So it's we're trying to make sure we have lots of different locations, but um, ease of uh, ability to get to them. Uh, just a few announcements uh, before we get started. Uh, View Conference is uh, March 26th to 29th at the end of the month. I think tickets are sold out. I know it's like last minute now. Um, but um, Ben, uh, the other organizer is walking around, uh, and myself, Tracy, uh, uh, we're all going to be there. Um, and then our next meetup is April 18th. Um, so we're trying to do the middle Wednesdays of every month, once a month. Uh, so our, our next meetup, April 18th, uh, we're going to go over the conference. Uh, so we hope everyone can make that. If you can't make the conference, um, it'll be a good good time to get sort of like the roundabout about uh, everything that happened. Um, after April, um, uh, we're going to do obviously one in May. Uh, we are looking for speakers. Uh, if any of you are interested, um, there's plenty of places to get in contact with myself or Ben. Um, uh, on the meetup.com, we have a website, Twitter, just contact either of us. Um, we're looking for two lightning talks right now at this point uh, for May. Um, so just let us know. Um, what else do I have here? So yeah, today's sponsor is uh, Bloomberg uh, BNA. Uh, Tracy, Ron, Bia, uh, welcome, welcome, and go. take it ahead. Okay, so I want to thank everyone for coming out and learning how we build VJ, VJS, SPs, SPAs against GraphQL. And just real quick housekeeping, bathrooms for the men are on the left, bathrooms for the women are on the right. <laughs> okay, so as, as this is Priya, Ron, I'm Tracy, we're uh, web developers here at Bloomberg BNA, and we built the first web app uh, using GraphQL. Um, so Bloomberg BNA is a subsidiary of Bloomberg LP, and so our main products are Bloomberg Law, Bloomberg Tax, Bloomberg Government, and Bloomberg Environment. And we're basically trying to do what Bloomberg LP did in the 1980s to the finance industry uh, by using data and analytics for non-financial professionals such as legal, tax, and labor. And most of you probably have heard of the terminal, which is really what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're always looking for um, app developers, and we're looking for app developers that are good problem solvers, that have a full stack understanding of web apps. And so some of the things that we use to build web apps are obviously JavaScript, Vue.js, GraphQL. We also use Java, Ruby on Rails, and Python. So if anybody's interested in joining our team, come see one of us at the end. Okay, so we had to build a new product. And we decided to use Vue.js for the front-end framework because it's awesome. And we needed a way to communicate with our database. So we decided to use GraphQL. So why did we use GraphQL? Well, GraphQL is a graph. You can grab the entire database in a single request. So a standard REST API, it's, you can only grab parts of the database, you know, multiple endpoints. So less calls to the database equals better performance. But that's not the best part about GraphQL. GraphQL is really easy to get going. You just write a thin layer over your existing data schema. So GraphQL also is widely adopted throughout the technical community, so there's a lot of great resources out there to help you with your projects. There's also tools available to integrate GraphQL, like Apollo Client, and there's also developer tools like Graphical, and Apollo has some really great dev tools, and you're going to see examples of that when Ron does some live coding in a little bit. So GraphQL is basically a single endpoint, and it's broken up into queries and mutations. So queries are used to get data from the graph, and mutations are used to change data in the graph. So, there, so to get going, you need to have some kind of server library. And there's basically libraries for all the major languages, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, PHP, Java, just the, all, basically all the major ones. So GraphQL is just an agnostic query language. You can really be, it can be written just about any language. So for our project, we actually wrote it in Java, but uh, we wrote the GraphQL layer in Java, but today Ron's gonna demonstrate, he's gonna be writing the GraphQL, la GraphQL layer in JavaScript. <laughs> so as I said, GraphQL is really easy to get uh, going. Um, you just define your types, you define your queries, and you're ready to go. 
It's also easy to query GraphQL once you get the endpoint up and running. And so the ease of use was really important to us um, because we had a compressed timeline for our project. So I think it took Ron maybe less than a week to actually get GraphQL up and running for us and we could start querying it. And so basically he's going to demonstrate how easy it is to um, work with GraphQL and how easy it is to set up. Very much, Priya. Uh, okay, so let's Tracy. get Tracy. Okay, you let's get started. You all the time. Can you believe it? <laughs> all right, so let's get started. Um, so the first thing I'm going to demonstrate, as Tracy pointed out, is I'm going to uh, recreate or create our GraphQL server, so we can start uh, exposing our database or data to GraphQL. Uh, first thing I want to show you guys is the data model that we'll be working with. Talk a little louder. Talk a little louder. So the data model that we work with is a very simple data model. Um, it's, it's an article which has a one-to-many association with authors. The article has all the fields you would expect an article to have. It has an ID, has a title, summary, body, image URL, and the author ID, which uh, you know has a reference to an author. Uh, so let's go ahead and start redefining those types as they exist in our system uh, in GraphQL's kind of schema definition language. Just to reiterate, right now I'm I'm writing the server side piece of uh, exposing GraphQL. The first type I want to define is the article type. Uh, as you can see above, it has an ID, which must be an int. The bang means the the thing that uh, the field cannot be null. It must have a title. Title cannot be null. It must have a summary. Uh, body. Image URL and an author. Uh, now you'll notice here that I'm not actually putting author ID here because what I want to be able to get to from from the article is the author itself, which is why it's a graph. You can actually get you could start with any type and get all the types that that type references uh, all in one call. So I'll start defining the uh, the author, which we referenced here. It's an int, which cannot be null. Yeah, we need a type for the author also. Did I mess it up? Oh. And let's uh, give it a name. It's a string, which cannot be null. And and uh, what GraphQL has is kind of this top-level query object where you expose kind of the entry points into your graph. So the two entry points that we're going to create are one to get all of the articles and to get all of the authors. Uh, and the way you ask for, for you define kind of, you ask for more than one thing is kind of rapid in this array syntax, as you can see here. And that means return a list of articles. Uh, we're going to do the same thing for authors. We're going to get all the authors. Um, so that's just redefining your types in uh, GraphQL's kind of schema language. Uh, you can't just define the types and expect it to be able to get that data out of your database. To actually map these types to your database, you use a thing called resolvers. So what am I, all I'm going to do here is for this query here, I'm going to get all the articles out of our database. And same with authors, I'm going to get all the authors out of our database. Um, and that's really all we need to get started. Uh, let's see if we could uh, actually show you how this works. So now that I have that set up, I have a GraphQL endpoint exposed, and it is exposing authors and articles. Uh, GraphQL comes with this very nifty tool called Graphical, which you can um, use to uh, run queries against a live GraphQL endpoint. 
So I'm going to go ahead and see what we're going to go ahead and see what this looks like. If you look at uh, this right pane, you'll see here the top level query object, and inside that you'll see the articles and the authors. You could drill even deeper and see all the fields that we find. Um, there's that. Now let's go ahead and attempt to get some articles and authors out of our database. There you go, we have articles and authors. Um, but one thing that I did not show was uh, how to, those relationships actually work. So this article has in it a way to get to the author, but currently this will not work because I did not I did not define how to resolve the author in my resolvers. So I get this null here. So to actually uh, define that relationship in uh, GraphQL for the article type and for that field, say author, the I'm sorry. Yeah, that's not right. the, I call my the get author method on my database to get the author given the author ID inside that article. Uh, and this route just points to uh, the article that was resolved. I'm going to do the same thing for author to get the articles. Right here. Get articles by author, and uh, that should get all the articles given an author ID. Let's see if this actually works. Okay, I made a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's tools that actually you don't have to do that, but we didn't install those. Yeah, we got lazy. <laughs> well, more like we didn't have time. Right, let's see what I did wrong here. Sorry. Oh, I forgot to define articles yeah. here. Find those off or those this articles. This is the fun of live coding. And why he's doing it, not us. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Should be good. All right, so now that I have that uh, that data, that way to resolve the author given an article map should now get the author associated with the articles. So there you go. It's as simple as that. And even it doesn't really get much more difficult than that when you're doing it live or when you're doing it on a real project either. So without further ado. I got it. Okay, we're good to go for you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Casey. Hi, everyone. Um, we saw that awesome GraphQL single endpoint data source, and we have our view in front of us. But there is some middle layer that has to fetch the data and does and should do the state management for us, right? Um, I'm sure you can use UX for state management, but after I talk about Apollo, we will just forget about UX. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Apollo makes it easy to build UI components by fetching data from GraphQL endpoint and it cache, caches the data locally and also updates an object that's being referenced everywhere within the app by itself. So you don't have to worry about updating it at all. Um, there are some app, um, Apollo clients for several JavaScript frameworks like uh, Vue, React, Amber, and Angular and also for Android and iOS operating. So the, the way it works is, um, like you saw, uh, GraphQL queries and mutations, you just have to write GQL queries and uh, define the variables that are part of those queries. And Apollo keeps watching those queries and uh, the variables associated. Um, so when those variables change, it knows that it has to run the query or rerun the query to fetch the data from GraphQL. 
but if you use UX on the other hand, um, you would have to write all the actions and mutations by yourself. Not only that, you have to update the state of that object wherever it's being referenced all by yourself. But Apollo figures this all for you. So, I mean, this is like re-emphasizing what Apollo does for us. So, um, um, and uh, the queries is to fetch the data as Tracy pointed and mutations are to change the data within the graph, right? So, let's say uh, we call a mutation and data gets changed in the backend. Not only that, Apollo returns back the updated data, which in turn gets updated in the UI. So, um, Ron's going to show us an example of how it works that example app that he has created for us. Okay, Ron. Good. All right, so now that we have this data flowing out of our GraphQL endpoint, what we want to do is take this data and display it on a website, right? That's the whole point of this uh, uh, this uh, meetup. So let's go ahead and get that going. Um, so you can see here that I have these two top-level queries. What I want to do is use these top-level queries to paint a view. So I'm going to go to view. This is our uh, fancy view app. As it exists now, let's see if we can get those articles and those uh, those authors to show up here. Okay. So after you have Polo installed and all that stuff, um, you you use this uh, kind of this Apollo property in your component to define the queries that you want to pull into this component to to render it, right? So the first query we're going to define is a way to get all of the articles. Uh, we also want to get the authors associated with the articles. And we're going to do this all in one request. And, uh, we can even go deeper if we want. Get the articles associated with those authors. Uh, let's do the same for the authors. That's really all, if you do, all you have to do is to get the uh, data flowing from the GraphQL endpoint to view. Um, and these will just get exposed as top level uh, view properties in your view component, like dot articles and dot authors. Yep. I can't hear you. Sorry, what did you say? That's being exported as a default, it doesn't have to have a name. Oh, you mean the component itself? Uh, I don't think so. I think it will get the name, or it will uh, infer the name based on the name of the file. Yeah, so. Yeah, like if I wanted to show this another component, because I imported it as app, I should just be able to do that. All right, so I already have the HTML written out for you guys, since you guys, most of you guys already know how HTML works. Um, and view. Uh, basically, all this is is a way to take that article, that list of articles, and render a list of articles, and take that list of authors and render that list of that list of authors. So there it is. Um, some reason the authors aren't coming through. Oh, I see. All right. Hopefully it works out. There we go. 
So we have our articles and our authors. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that the first two authors has this test author one, and the last one has this test author two. And these first two articles are referencing this article up here. So uh, what we want to show you is how mutations work and how when you mutate state on the server side, uh, the, all the other places where that state or object shows up in your application also automatically gets updated. So what we want to show is when we change this guy's name, does that name change everywhere else? So the first thing we need to do is define a mutation to set that name. Uh, we're going to call it set author name. And that requires an ID. Uh, that accepts an int, which is the, uh, the ID of the author and the new name for the author. And it's, uh, it's important to note here that the, the author that we're actually returning is the author that we're modifying. Uh, this will become important later on. Let's go ahead and map that into our database. Uh, that should be all we have to do to set the author's name. Um, let's uh, go to graphical and see uh, whether or not this works. Okay. All right, so now if I refresh, you'll see in the right pane before where there was only query, there is now this kind of top-level mutation object. And when I click into it, it has that mutation that I... Uh, I defined, um, and it accepts an ID and a name. I'm going to go ahead and run it to make sure that it actually works. Uh, so these are our current authors. What I want to do is change this first, au first author's name to something else. Let's go ahead and give that a try. Name. We'll go ahead and say Priya. You Priya. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there we go. Uh, there you go. The author that got returned was the was the first author, and the name was changed. Let's go ahead and query all the authors again to make sure that that change did indeed take effect, and it did. Um, so that's mutations. Uh, what we want to show you is how when we use this pattern on the front end, uh, how it uh, uses the new author that it received to update the state in your entire application. There we go. Okay. All right, so the first thing I want to read or find is that, uh, or I want to wire up that uh, that mutation into our view application. I call it set set author name like the um, mutation itself, and accept an ID and a name. And now I'm going to call it the mutation. Uh, it's going to accept an int ID, which cannot be null, and a string name, which cannot be null, and we're going to pass those variables into our actual mutation. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, we are also going to return the, the fields that we changed. And this will become important in a second. So the other thing that's important is the, the variables that we're passing in um, uh, match the same variables that you're giving to the mutation on the back end. And now that this is defined, uh, what we should see is when I, when I modify this first author, which is Priya Kathiri, um, what we want to see is everywhere else in your application where this author is being referenced automatically gets updated. Let's go ahead and see what happens. It works. So you can imagine how much easier this is than um, using Vuex by itself, where you're using Vuex by itself and just calling a REST endpoint or something like that. First thing you'd have to do is call that mutation or call that uh, that endpoint on your back end, and you'd have to refetch the new author, and then you'd have to figure out everywhere in, the, in your in your uh, your app state where that author is being referenced, and make that update yourself. So one of the nice things that about GraphQL plus Polo is that kind of automates all the state management for you. Uh, I wouldn't do it for. If it's exposed to GraphQL, I would probably not use Vuex. Um, like, we've even stopped using Vuex altogether yeah, because yeah. Uh, after you switch to Vuex, it kind of becomes a lot of boilerplate to set, these, uh, set all this stuff up in the application. The only time we ever have local state is if that state is not persisted in the back end. In that case, it's kind of useful to use Vuex, but uh, at that point, you're really just sending, like, really simple properties in your application. So it almost makes sense to use something simpler than UX like a like view stash or something like yeah. that. Yeah. It's really just a blob and there's all this other boilerplate you have to write. Um, let me show you. So so the way this is actually working, um, if you want to go inside the graph using Polo Dev Tools, uh, so if you actually look inside our cache, um, Polo Dev Tools or Apollo uh, internalizes the graph. For every ID it receives, it saves that object at the top level, and it figures out where all that object is being referenced. So it knows that because author is being referenced by this article, when I change its name, I should also change it here. So, what's that? Power of mutation. Thank you, Ron. This is Apollo Kuhn. Okay. That's all the state management for you, right? So we saw how Apollo automates the state management for us and internalizes the graph in your browser. Um, so in essence, uh, Apollo automates data fetch and state management for you, and uh, UJS automates the uh, UI updates for you. Um, so here is a little diagram of how it would be if you use REST API UX for your state management and uh, you as your presentation layer. Um, so as Ron mentioned or pointed, uh, this could become complex, right? As your app grows, state management can become can be more complex and uh, error prone too, and a maintenance hassle. Um, that's the reason we figured a way to <laughs> get away from it. So here is how it would be if you end up using Apollo and GraphQL. The middle circle is completely uh, removed from the diagram. So Apollo kind of abstracts uh, GraphQL for you and also does state management. So the next thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, reactive variables. Um, this is the most important or one of the most important parts of Apollo. Um, the way that it knows when to uh, rerun a query or not rerun a query is through watching those variables that we find um, in our view component. And the other best thing about using Apollo is that code resides in your um, in your view file itself. Unlike UX, it resides in another JavaScript file, but all the other uh, 
the Apollo queries and all those mutations, they all reside in that particular component that it fetches data for. Um, so, I would like to uh, give an example of how this, these reactive variables work. Um, ours is a news site and uh, users search for stories that are relevant to their area of expertise. Um, let's say a user is searching for, uh, we have the search query and let's say this uh, keyword is one of the variables part of that query and if the user searches for air pollution and Apollo fetches the first 10 stories that match that query string um, and then the user again searches for water pollution, it again reruns the search query because the variable, the keyword that's changed, right? Um, and then let's say the user again changed his or her mind and then searches for air pollution. Do you think Apollo is going to rerun the query? No, right. Because it internalizes the graph, right? So it knows that it has already fetched that data and it fetches it from its cache. And uh, Ron's going to show an, an example of that. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, show you guys our final example. We're going to show you it, an example of using Vue's reactivity set or leveraging Vue's reactivity system to uh, also automate state management. Um, so the first thing I want to define here is a way to get a single author and a single article. I have those defined. I have to do the uh, the mapping code to the database. And do the same thing for articles. Alright, so now that I have those two things defined, we want to go and verify that they are, they indeed work. We're going to do that with our handy dandy graph graphical. Uh, you see that I have those two now appearing in my list of uh, fields in that top level query object, and when I run it, I should be able to get any author given its ID. There you go, it works. Um, so what we want to do is we want to leverage use reactivity system in a way that whenever the uh, ID associated with the view for an author changes, it automatically refetches the data associated with that author and repaints your view. Um, <clears throat> instead of doing all that work yourself in UX and stuff like that. So the first thing I'm going to do is define a reactive variable. I always mess this up. All right. So the first uh, author that we're going to show is just the default author, the author with ID zero. And we're going to go ahead and create a way to fetch that author using Apollo. All right. So this syntax is going to be a little bit different because now we have this reactive variable to worry about. Uh, it's going to accept an ID, which is an integer that cannot be null. And it's going to pass that to graph, graph, the graph QL for it. What do they call it? Author. Okay. I got the ID, the name. Okay. What's up? No, no, no. Sorry. Thank you. And we can even go one layer deep, a little more deep. So you can kind of see how deep you can go. You can really go to any depth. Um, 
So the major difference here is now I'm going to pass that reactive variable to this query, which Apollo will then watch. And whenever that variable changes, it knows it has to go and refetch that data from, from GraphQL. So uh, what's going on here is the ID which I'm passing into this query up here is the reactive ID which I defined in data. So now if I define a way in the UI to change author ID, what it should do is go back to GraphQL and get that author whenever it changes. Go ahead and see if that actually works. <laughs> I have this all written out too. Oh. Uh, so all we're doing is we're creating a select with a drop down whose model is that author ID, paints all the authors in a list or in for all the options of the drop down, and whenever I select it, it should recreate GraphQL. Okay, so we have our drop down as the two authors in it. Um, see what happens when I select a different author? So voila, it automatically goes and refreshes that author. Um, another interesting thing is the way Apollo actually caches the data. So where I to start with a fresh cache and uh, select the second author, the first time I select it, it does have to go and hit GraphQL but because it knows that I've already very recently made that made the query to get that second author. It does not fetch it again, good story of the cache. So like even if you go to Facebook you'll notice like when you do certain things, the first time it's sort of bit slow, and then when you do something else, or you do the same thing again, even though it's, it renders the exact same view, it's very quick, right? That's because it's already cached that data. And this can have many cascading changes, right? You can have an author which has an article, which is that art, something else in that article is being used in another query, which is reactive. And just by making that one change, selecting a different author, your entire view and all those queries get refetched automatically to uh, rehydrate your view. So, that's it. Sorry, didn't keep up. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I was so engrossed in what he was doing, trying to catch his mistakes. <laughs> so um, so we just kind of give, give you the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with GraphQL. Um, so I just want to point out two more, two thing, other things that GraphQL can do. Uh, one thing is that you can have, you can access your data, data externally. So what I mean by that is a data resolver can get the data from anywhere. It can get it from your local database or you can get it from some other systems in your organizations. So what that means is you can take, you can basically serve all these resources from anywhere in your organization into one GraphQL server. It acts as a single data source. And this is great for downstream products because you have one endpoint and one graph to dealing with. So another thing that um, GraphQL can do is real-time updates. So basically you have subscriptions. And so when, whenever the subscription, sorry, whenever the backend changes, the front end UI automatically gets updated without any end user interaction. So what this means is Apollo can query, can subscribe to a query, and then whenever it returns new data, it automatically adds it to the local state and then view automatically updates the UI. So this basically can make your website appear like it's a living website. And this is basically how Facebook, who created GraphQL, um, actually update the user's timelines. So um, the one thing we really want, oh, go ahead. Say that up to the 
to the um, line. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think there's maybe two modes to do it. I think uh, one of, you know, on like every real time update system over HTTP, you are gonna, you're either going to have like some kind of WebSockets implementation or some kind of polling implementation. Uh, I think there's ways to do both. GraphQL is pretty agnostic about how you want to do those updates. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the one thing we really want you to take away from this meetup is that state management is not fun. And um, so as we developed our app, we really came to realize that it's basically, it's complex and it's just really a pain in the butt. Um, so um, basically, so I guess full disclosure, full confession, uh, we initially start use Vue apps, right? And basically it meant that client Ron here, every time we had a new feature, had to update all the state management code. And he quickly got really tired of it. Um, and so he figured out a different way and that was GraphQL. So basically GraphQL, I'm mean, sorry, Apollo. GraphQL and Apollo is basically state management without pain. And so if you add Vue.js to it, you really get an awesome stack. So GraphQL, Apollo, and Vue.js. So is there any questions? It's an awesome stack. It is an awesome <laughs> stack. <laughs> there any questions? No? No? Thank you. So. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I think uh, traditionally it's actually used with React. Yeah, it is. But, uh, but we haven't. Done we it. haven't done it. We we like you, so we're sticking with you. Yeah, we, I don't think we have any React apps yet. <laughs> no, we don't have any. We don't do any React actually. Not that I know. Of. Yeah. Unless maybe BigGov does it. No, all of you. Probably uh, the fat slabs that uh, David was doing, like right? but we used React. No, uh, some mobile apps. Yeah, okay, so we but used React once for, for yeah. uh, mobile apps, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, really, whatever front-end yeah. framework you desire to use, there yeah. will be Doesn't Apollo matter. or something like Apollo for it. Right. You, uh, but you do have Apollo client for React as well, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Performance increase? Oh. Oh, uh, using, you mean GraphQL, Apollo versus a normal REST API? I don't I know if it's an increase, it's just a pain in the butt. No, work. no. <laughs> well, I don't know if by virtue really, of yeah. kind of using a graph, yeah. uh, there's kind of an inherent performance increase because usually when you're in typical REST API, you have a endpoint for every resource. And, uh, if you want to get so say you get an article and you want to get the authors associated with that article. Usually that's like two calls, right? You want to get the article first, yeah. you have a bag of IDs that you get from the article, and then you have to get all the authors associated right. with it. So the nice thing about uh, GraphQL is it has this kind of uh, sparse field set implementation and uh, a way um. to uh, <clears throat> expose your data you know, as a graph, which uh, allows you to kind of get all the data in, in one big chunk across one network uh, or one call to your network. Okay, so I we mean, did, I think we did notice the performance. But it, I mean, really, is it dramatic? I guess that's the real question. I think it's pretty dramatic. You think it is? Okay. It's probably a little bit about the cost involved. Like? No, it's open it's source. source. Oh, no, it's open source. It's open source. Originally, there was this kind of weird patents thing going on where they had a patents file inside their uh, inside the repo, which I think meant that uh, yeah, well, you, you could use it, but you couldn't sue Facebook. So, but right, they, they've since yeah. got they've since gotten rid of it because of all right. the uh, the community uproar, right? So, right. you don't actually have to pay any money. It's all open source, yes. basically, right? Uh, uh, GraphQL, Apollo, Vue, yeah, it's all open source. So. Good question. What did you say? To walk back through the state, like how it evolved, like what, what does it like, I don't know. I've never what? actually looked. Like some test author wants to create a new Michael Bloomberg. He wants uh, to trace it back. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. I don't think it does. 
It does allow you to see all the queries that are going on, stuff like that, but you can't go back. Yeah, you do get a query okay. list. So I double click on this. Um, this is called a watch query, uh, which basically means it has these variables that it's watching. Whenever these variables change, it'll go ahead and uh, rerun the query. You can even run it against your GraphQL endpoints to see what gets returned, but I don't think they have any kind of a way to go back in time. Unfortunately. Uh, yeah, for wait, me, wait, wait, hold on. What did you say again? Can you speak louder? I mean, there is definitely a lot of learning involved, yeah. um, but as you can see, it's really not that difficult. And it really doesn't seem to get much more difficult after you've, uh, from what you saw, or from what you saw, but, uh, for me personally, it was very cathartic, right? It's like complete gobs and gobs of this, this code where I was manually fetching data from the server. <laughs> yes. and the he so, was literally uh, the client. Yeah. For me, it was uh, it felt very like he stopped banging his head, basically, what happened. Right. But there are definitely some places where it does get kind of weird to implement because, like, it has its own life cycle, kind of, right? You can't say in mounted, there's no point, there's no hook in a component where you can say, oh, wait till all the data is fetched. Really nothing like that. So if you're using mountain hooks and all that stuff and all the life cycle hooks, and you can't expect them to work the same way that it would work if you're just using UX, right? If you, it will actually wait for UX to fetch the state. So there is that. But once you get around that kind of weird issue, then it becomes that simple. Okay. Oh, uh, we use, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We use Vue Apollo. And then underneath that, it references Apollo 2.0. Um, it's pretty nice. Pretty nice. Uh, one thing that does kind of annoy me about it is that the documentation is nowhere near as good as Vue.js is, but horrible. you're never going to get documentation as good as Vue.js, right? So. It, it, it's actually pretty sparse. Um, so he disappeared for a while, and I was stuck doing a lot of the work. And documentation for Apollo was just really bad. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that you have to kind of intuit yourself. Yeah. The documentation in some instances is just wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's not that great. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's definitely not like Vue. Oh, they're, they're going to be in ViewCon. It's 2017. Oh. Just What's the uh, community like uh, for uh, GraphQL? Yeah, is it developed entirely by Facebook? I think uh, GraphQL it's it's still itself is, yeah. but uh, all the tools surrounding it are developed yeah. by people in the community. Apollo actually is the people who do Meteor. Is that the other one? Yeah, they actually do Apollo. Yeah. And I feel like Apollo does have kind of the most state of the art GraphQL implementation. And, and most yeah. of the documentation for Apollo, the examples are all with React. So yeah. that's really the more that's the, that's yeah. the more com the traditional combination. That's, that's true. That's the main point. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yep. It's just so. It's e it's seriously, it's just so much easier. The, the learning curve on Vue is just so much easier, right? React is, yeah. I mean, like, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a JavaScript guru, and I just picked up Vue fairly quickly. So I so, think it's just a, less of a learning curve. Uh, the specific reason we picked it was because uh, we are not app maintainers. We're app builders. Um, yeah. And we have other people in the organization that aren't necessarily, necessarily very familiar with JavaScript. So... It really made sense to pick the thing that was the best documented and the easiest to use. And yeah. For us, that was Vue.js. Um, I think. Yeah. Yeah, mobile is better. Yeah. 
Right. Right. Yeah, yeah that's true. But right. I mean, Vue's newer, right? So I think they took a lot of what was really great about React and maybe even what was good about Angular, if you could say that, and, uh, you know, put it together. So, you know. Yeah, I, I, haven't ever, I haven't really figured out where you use React versus Vue yet. I kind of feel like after your application re reaches a certain complexity, maybe you should use React. But I feel like, uh, I don't feel like your front end should ever really get that complex. Yeah. So. The Vue.js site actually have a good sort of left-to-right comparison between the and I definitely recommend the Yeah, actually we used it when we made the choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's certain things that are better about Vue, like the performance is better because of the reactivity system, mm -hmm. and, uh, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. right away. Yeah. I mean, they both have backing by large companies. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Uh, oh, please. Yes. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> oh, view, the View Apollo. There's a View Apollo uh, module or plugin or whatever. Is that, is that what you mean? I was curious about this also because I know this, a lot of your stuff is already imported. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is some oh, wiring. Great, code. great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, we actually. Do, right? Well, actually, I mean, well, Apollo is really the interface between GraphQL and whatever you're fronting. And so, right, we actually have a talking to GraphQL, which is actually, it's in Java, but it doesn't really matter. It's just an endpoint, right? Is that, that, it doesn't really matter. Uh, pretty much every language will have its own. Yeah. Pretty big community around right. uh, serving GraphQL. Yeah. Probably the biggest out of any, I guess, graph protocol out there. Yeah. I mean, there's really JSON API that's the only competitor, but it's nowhere near as vibrant as GraphQL's community is. It's all agnostic, really. Again, thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, again, our next meetup is more questions. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? Yes. We're gonna put it up. We're gonna we'll, put it we'll put it up. Yeah, so, view on the slide. Yeah, view, yeah. view DC has a GitHub repo where we're putting all the presentations. Uh, we're also screen recording. So. Right, and he actually will make available both the server side, the and GraphQL yeah. part, and yeah. I'm sorry, server, the GraphQL part and the, the front the part. And the slides. You did do the screen recording? Yeah, I did. Yeah, he did. I hope so. <laughs> Press the buttons. <laughs> it pressed them. So can you talk about the idea behind GraphQL has a single input? Well, if you have a single endpoint, is there a way to manage how different forms are like how Oh, yeah, you can have this. Yeah, you can speak to that. I don't know how to. Mm. So, mm. <laughs> so, I mean, Really, authorization is kind of done through the same endpoint. You just pass in the right headers or whatever you're using for, you know, to pass that token back and forth. Then, uh, by virtue of having that token, when you go to, is it me? Yeah, you're on. Yeah, you're on. Uh, when you go to these resolvers, there is also, say you had Say you are only allowed to show 90 words in the body for an article, which is something we actually do. Uh, for the body of an article when, when that user is not logged in, right? So uh, what you would do here is return dv.get and I guess, I don't know, 
say the root was the body, and then you wanted to, uh, you would have to do something like get 80 words. So you'd have probably CTX is logged in. Root. So it would be something like that. Uh, so because you passed that token in, you would have some way to tell GraphQL whether or not a user is logged in. You would expose that through something like the property is logged in and your context object. And uh, given that, you would either return 80 words or just the entire paragraph or the entire body itself. So if you actually go to our website, um, log in. You like that. So you're getting 80 words here, and that's essentially what that uh, that body is doing. But when I do log in, you get the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there are layers on top of GraphQL that you could. Uh, you can add like there's ways for it to kind of cut out this whole resolver layer in the middle and uh, do kind of an ORM thing. But, uh, I don't think that would get you what you're asking for either. You would have to do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think in that case, you would only allow, you would do the checks here in the mutations instead, which is also what we do. Like, like certain users have to be logged in to do certain things. Yeah. So. If you have personalized, you have to be logged in to do it, otherwise they can it. Yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, GraphQL is, just, like I said, it's a very lightweight kind of wrapper around your, your schema. You still have to do all this stuff yourself. Unless you use something advanced like an aura that kind of abstracts everything away. Yeah. Anybody else? You're waiting for someone to start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, again, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, next meetup is going to be the We're going to go over the conference. Please come. We want lots of talk about um, and then again, uh, we'll get talks in May, we'll get two lightning talks, like 20 minutes to, um, to, uh, on that day. And that day will be here, right? Yes. Yes. May will be here. So yeah, May is here. April, April will be at Politico and Rock. So again, thank you all for coming. Thank There's you all. Here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.